warm introduction and thank you all joining. Thank you all for joining this evening to discuss an essential read Under the Stretcher with author Max Levin. Under the Stretcher takes you into the 2014 Operation Protective Edge, one of the latest of the Gaza-Israeli conflicts through the eyes of Max Levin, an American-born Israeli soldier who immigrated to, in 2012 to join the Israeli army. For those who want to learn more about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, this book offers personal stories from an American-raised boy with American values who served in the modern Israeli army. It's an honor to introduce Stephen Shalowitz. Stephen is the host of Jewish National Fund USA's Israel podcast and the One Way Ticket Show podcast. He is a JNF USA New York board member and on JNF USA social media committee and invites you to connect with him on all social media at Stephen Shalowitz. Max Levin was a lone soldier who served in Israel's Special Forces Unit within the Paratroopers Division. He received the equivalent of an Israeli Purple Heart after being wounded in Operation Protective Edge, and he and his team received an award for excellence for their performance in the operation. His best-selling memoir, Under the Stretcher, recounts his experiences in the Israeli Defense Forces. A percentage of the proceeds from the book will be donated to an Israeli nonprofit organization that helps soldiers in coping with difficult combat memories and adapting back to civilian life. Levin is a vice president at Landmark Equity Properties and does freelance work for venture, for venture capital investing. And he's a proud JNF Future Root Society member. Please join me in welcoming Max Levin. Stephen and Max, thank you. I now turn the program over to you. All right, thanks so much for that, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. And good evening, Max. Good to see you again. Hi, Stephen. Good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And listen, we've got lots to talk about. You know, I'm a very slow reader, but I raced through. <laughs> the, let me tell you, I raced through this book, your book, Under the Stretcher. I can't recommend it enough because it really does take us into what life is like. Uh, for an IDF soldier, and indeed, it tells your story. And I really want to start, though, Max, by talking about Zionism for a moment, and then we'll we'll really get into the book. Because uh, for those that are joining us on this call this evening, uh, you may like to know that Jewish National Fund USA's year-long series called Conversations on Zionism: Reclaiming the Narrative. It's this whole year-long program, as I said, it aims to bring to light the beauty, inclusivity of Zionism, create loud and proud Zionists empower people to define Zionism for themselves rather than to allow detractors to define Zionism for us and on us. And so it's in that spirit really as part of this whole campaign that I wanna ask you about Zionism, Max, because about a third or a quarter of the way into the book, it's on page 76 um, for anyone that has the book and for you, Max, you, you reference Zionism and it talks about when you're parachuting in and I just wanna read this First, this little snippet here, it says the view, and that's of course the view when you're uh, up there parachuting down for your first fall. The view of Israel is breathtaking, and I felt incredibly lucky to be able to be there. At the moment, I was filled with Zionistic pride and happy to be going through all those hardships if it meant I would be one of the soldiers guarding our amazing country. And that, of course, was written uh, during the time that you were in basic training. So I want to start with you by asking you about Zionism and your thoughts on Zionism. How do you uh, uh, define Zionism and what does it mean to you? That's a really good question. So let's start with a definition. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I define Zionism is the Jewish national movement of self-determination. And that kind of relates in a lot of ways, you know, what is self-determination? I would say that's the ability to be able to control your own destiny. And for a long time, the Jewish people haven't had that ability. You know, we haven't had a place of our own and a place to call home. Very similarly, that connects with the America and American people, and you can see in the Declaration of Independence, you know, focusing on um, giving certain liberties, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I see that directly related to the ability for self-determination. In short, we've, as a Jewish people, have wanted for so long this ability to control our lives, our liberty, and our own pursuit of happiness. And to me, Zionism is that ability and that determination to control the simple basic necessities that we want in life. And that's why it was so important for so long 
because of our history, because of, you know, um, things like the Holocaust and the Spanish Inquisition, and we can go back 2000 years of being persecuted to finally have a country that we call our own uh, for all Jewish people around the world. And I guess if we go back to that point where I was jumping out of a plane and for that brief 10 to 20 seconds before I had to focus on landing, and hopefully not breaking my legs, um, I had to think about, you know, I could see, I could see the land of Israel that I was uh, signed up to defend. And I felt this Zionistic pride and this new, very new ability as a Jewish person to have that control over my own destiny, which is something that for generations uh, we've never had. And just being able to understand that I'm defending that and I'm a part of that and keeping that alive um, just filled me with pride at the moment. Right. I want to go back to your Zionistic roots in a second, but I see that uh, Sarah Cohn has put in to the chat, which I want to direct everybody to right now to register for upcoming conversations um, and conversations on Zionism and indeed master classes as well on Zionism. These are conversations with Jewish National Fund USA CEO Russell Robinson and global thought leaders, panel discussions on Zionism, again, master classes, et cetera. So there's a lot going on this year. We wanna direct everybody to the chat and take note of that. Now, as far as you and your Zionistic roots, you really grew up in a, a Zionistic family, didn't you? Yeah, it really stems back to my mother and father, uh, Judy and Bud Levin. Uh, who worked very closely on the boards of JNF for my entire lifetime. I grew up going on JNF missions every year. Uh, I would say, stemming back to one specific memory, it would be around when I was eight years old, going to the West Bank, visiting my good friend Udi Nebo, as he was a soldier in the IDF. And uh, being the enthusiastic eight-year-old that I was, going and seeing um, all of the Israeli soldiers, really taking all of that in, gave me this immense sense of pride to be here and to have our own country and to be able to stand there and defend it. And I told myself one day, you know, I want to be like Udi. I want to come here and do that as well. And then, you know, that just kind of progressed throughout my life, going back to Israel every year, meeting Israeli friends at 16, uh, doing an exchange program and really not just becoming a visitor to Israel, but being a part of the society itself and you know, living in the society and having friends in the society. And then you know, I'd say the nail on the coffin uh, was in 2013 or 14 when I was finishing, or sorry, 2010 when I was finishing high school uh, doing March of the Living and going to Poland and going with the survivors and hearing their stories and then coming to Israel and going from the place of great death and great anguish to a great place of great life and culture and happiness and understanding that, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't something we can take for granted. You know, you can just look at the history of Israel and how many times people have tried to take it away from us. And this is something that we need to cherish and hold and defend and do whatever we can to keep it a rem the remarkable place that it is. And so at that point, I said, you know, I made good, on, I wanted to make good on my promise as an eight year old and then come move to Israel and join the IDF and do what I could to help defend the Israeli uh, country. You know, you know, Max, there aren't too many people that make good on their promises to their eight year old self. I think you were rather unique there. Uh, well, you know, it's something that it's not just the eight year old, it's the going every year and continuing right. it up. and. It all, it's a, it's a snowball that just kind of rolls and rolls down and uh, eventually you, you know, make good on the commitment. Indeed. And so you, you go and you join the idea, but before you even do that, it's, it's interesting. There was resistance from your family, from your mom in particular, <laughs> and even as Zionistic as she was and is, there was resistance because she wanted you to go straight to college. And I love it how in the book you pointed out that she actually applied to colleges for you, right? <laughs> yes, my brother is your typical Jewish mother. How many Jewish mothers want their kids to join the army and everything that that can, that can happen with that? Any and army, let alone the Israeli Any army, army. Yeah. yes. Any, any situation where you know that your kid could, uh, his safety could be in jeopardy. And, you know, obviously she was uh, hesitant and resistant towards it, but 
I think after a lot of coaxing and a lot of talking, we came to an agreement that this was something that I needed to do for my own self growth and my own well being. Um, and, uh, you know, she very quickly changed from having hesitations and being resistant to being as supportive as a Jewish mother with anything can be, you know, uh, and I tell some interesting stories of really how supportive Jewish mothers can be, especially when their kids are in the army within the book. Um, right, we're going to get to that in a second that that happened after your your training was over before you were deployed. We're going to get to that one. We're going to bookmark that for a second. So I really want to take sort of the whole arc of the book and take all of those that have joined us this evening on a journey through the book and through the narrative, because you end up going to Israel as a lone soldier, you make a whole family of friends and you're thrown into basic training. And I will say, and I told this to you the other day when we had our first conversation, that after reading about what you went through for basic training, I will never again complain when I'm working out at the gym because you really went through the ringer. I find that funny because I still complain when I go to the gym. And when I was in basic training, I was complaining every step of the way as well. I think one of the things that got me through the miles and miles of, um, of hiking and training and going you know, up and down every mountain you could see was one, um, seeing a little bit of a bigger picture and why I was there to begin with and why I wanted to be here. But then a little bit of competitiveness and having your friends around you and saying, oh, you know, my friend Batalo is right in front of me and he's carrying, you know, an extra 20 pounds than me and he's doing fine. He's doing fine and I got to do as well as he can. Kind of that, that iron, you know, iron sharpens iron as you, as you continue to go on. The ultimate peer pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Was there also a sense though, when you were going through basic training, and again, I want people to pick up the book to read really what you had to go through. We won't be able to go through everything uh, uh, in the course of our conversation, but was there also a sense while you were going through it that you also wanted to show your American friends and peers that you were doing something meaningful? It's not to say that going to college isn't meaningful, but while people were partying, you were actually in basic training for the IDF. And that's a whole different level. Yeah, um, that's a interesting question. No one's ever asked me that question before. And it's something that's kind of in the back of your head when you're in the army is you know that your friends are off partying in college and having a good time. Um, but I think that it's not something, you know, I had um, my commander God, who was my sergeant in, uh, in basic training and throughout most of my training, he had uh, told us a very valuable lesson in the special forces, especially which was um, to be quiet and don't talk about it. And the point of that really is humility. You know, you're gonna be going through a lot of things and you're going to be um, doing a lot of difficult things and a lot harder than your friends and your family and other places, but that doesn't mean that you're more special or better than them in any way. You're just here now and doing it. So you need to understand that and you need to take that to heart and, you know, be humble, be strong. And um, with that, be quiet. And that's that kind of inner strength that they want to promote and they want you to be able to, to have. And that, uh, that self-confidence that comes with it as well. And I think a lot of the training was about building those skills and those qualities and really focusing on them. So as much as I had friends in America that were, having a good time in college. I think I was so focused on the here and now, and at some points really just trying to survive the, the day or the week that that was really my priority. Throughout the book, there were so many times, Max, where you and your comrades went without sleep. I mean, dare I say, I'm one of those people that if I get less than seven hours of sleep, I'm totally useless. Um, you'll be glad to know that I got seven hours last night. So hopefully I won't be too okay. useless today or I got six and a half. So I might just be a little bit. But <laughs> the point is, is that you went for four days at one point without sleep. And then when you had that paintball challenge, again, we don't have enough time to go into what the paintball is and all the other activities you did. But you went, you said, for 100 hours without sleep. And I'm just wondering, it's one thing to do it when you're in training. It's a whole other thing to be able to have to withstand the difficulty of doing it when you're actually having to have your senses heightened when you're out on a mission. So how do you handle not sleeping for four days? So the whole concept of not sleeping and with that food deprivation, water deprivation, um, 
going up and down 30 kilometers, uh, you know, 20 miles at a time. The point of training really is to make it harder than the war, physically at least. Um, so when you do come time to do missions and you do come time to, to do war, you're ready for it. Like any athlete has to train. And, you know, if you're training for a marathon, they tell you to like run a marathon and a half before you do the marathon, because that'll be easier. And that's really how training was, you know, it was to push you past first, push you past whatever limits you thought you had. And I remember clearly, I was talking to my commander Yoni at the beginning of training and he told us a glimpse of something we would do at the end, which is we would, you know, carry a stretcher for um, 25 kilometers uh, with 400 pounds on our back. And I was looked at him, I was like, you're crazy. That's impossible. People can't physically do that. And he's like, no, you're gonna, we're gonna do that, you know, wait a year and like a half and we'll build you up and get you ready for that. And again, the, the point of it is really to, you know, practice hard and harder than you play and get ready for the game. And, you know, that was, that was the goal of training is to really push us to our very limits and then teach us that there's more to give and more to go and more you can do and really uh, have an understanding of what we as people are capable of and know that in hard times, there's always more you can give and there's always uh, more to do. And I think that that was kind of the goal of it, you know, to, to prepare you for war, but to even make it harder than war itself. I, I know that that's the goal, but physically, how do you do it? Is it just a, is it just a case of mind over matter? Because oftentimes these things are. Yeah, I mean, that's what we have in the tryouts, right? Uh, the tryouts are, uh, at least for the special forces one that I took for Syrat Tamkhanim, um, that tryout is about four days of just nonstop sprinting and running and crawling. And the whole goal of that is to weed out who has the inner strength in them to, to be able to do the training and to be able to go on and move forward. And, you know, you take, you take people that are already in a great place like the paratroopers and then we take from there and we do another tryout and we weed them out and we say, look, we're going to try to break you. And your one goal here is to not be broken. That's it. I don't care if you're the slowest one here. You just have to keep going. That's all we want from you. And that's what training is like as well. You know, and it's not at a certain point, it's just about survival and finishing and doing the best that you can um, while building up that immense inner strength and that mentality and you know whether it's the Israeli special forces or the American special forces I think that 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 inner strength and that mentality to never give up and never quit and to keep going is just something that um, we one we build it over time and two it's something that you just have to you know make it a reality and you have to set your mind to those goals and say that no matter what you're going to finish and right. there's you know when you have that kind of mindset there's very little that people can do to take that away from you. I just want to remind everybody that's joining us this evening to hear you, Max, is that if they have any questions or comments, they can put them in the chat. We do have one, which I'm going to get to in a second, Sherry. So thank you, W. Sherry Moore. So thank you so much. I'm going to get to yours in a second. Uh, anyone else, please put them in. I'm going to lump them all together. Um, I am going to just jump ahead, though, to where you are today, and then we're going to get back to the book. Uh, are you taking then the lessons from basic training into your life today? And oh, it's about, re about resistance or, or perseverance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could take it as the fact that finishing this book, which took about six years to, to write and publish, um, you know, it was a long journey and it took a lot of rewrites and a lot of edits. And I could say this book has been rewritten and written, you know, at least four times. But, you know, when you set your mind to something and you say, this is what I want to accomplish, it doesn't matter how long it takes and how many times you have to rewrite it and, you know, how frustrating that can be. You have a goal in mind and you set it and that's what you need to do and finish. And I think that I can at least vouch for a lot of my friends. The second they set a goal and they say, this is what I want to do, they follow through and they have that ability to, you know, I can count on them for that. I'm only half joking, Max, when I ask you. So, so fasting on Yom Kippur is not a problem for you, I'd imagine. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, like I said, I'll complain like everybody else, but at the end of the day, I'll get it done. Okay, that's good to hear. 
<laughs> kindred, kindred spirits. Let's just go to um, a couple of questions and then we want to get on to your, the actual operations uh, sure. that, that you had both in Gaza and in the West Bank. Um, again, and everyone, thank you for joining us and Sherry. Max, are you willing to do these book talks to other Jewish organizations or synagogues? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, feel free to message me on my new Instagram or Facebook or if email. Do you want to give one? Yeah, do you want to give it out? Yeah, um, I can type it in the chat too. Yes. So everybody reach out to Max because again, the book, it's a great book. And like I say, I couldn't put it down. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, let's see, we want to go to Krav Maga, San Diego. Thanks for writing in. What made you choose Sayare San Hanim? And did you consider any other units? Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. And we all echo the thank you, Max, by the way. Uh, well, thank you. Um, well, like everybody else, I wanted to go to Matkala Shayetet, which are the, the top of the top. Um, I did the tryout, didn't pass. Um, and then, you know, didn't give up either and said to myself, okay, what's next? How can I still lead to uh, one of the special forces units? And um, set my mind on Zayat Sankhanim. I thankfully had uh, family and friends that guided me towards that. My good uh, family friend, Ari Karambo, was in Duke Devon. I spoke to him uh, immensely about his experience, asked him what he thought would be, you know, a lot of the things about these units are they look for certain personalities because your team has to mesh. And they have to mesh in a really close knit way. And so when you talk to people, you say, oh, which, which one do you think I would be good for? You know? And that was the one that two of my friends had recommended. So I said, great, um, we'll go there. On a more lighthearted note though, my favorite color is red and the beret for some Khanim is red. So I was like, That's, that sounds good to me. Let's do that one. I'll look good in the color. I'll look good in my uniform. That's all it was? You know, when you're 18, 19. Great photos. <laughs> when you're 18 and 19, uh, I would say a lot of these military units, whether it's San Khanim or Gibad Dir Golani, mostly do the same thing. And what really differentiates them is a little bit of the stigmas and personalities of the people and then the color of their hat. So I picked the hat that I liked. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, let, I want to go back to the to the questions here before we move on. Uh, let's see, we have that. Uh, yes, Malka wanted to know, are you back in the United States? Yes, you are back in the United States and you're in the City of Angels. You're in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Okay. And then Mark Werner, thanks for writing in. Max, loved your book and your Zionist commitment. I've worked on both of your training bases. Mikhe Alon and Bach San Khanim, and we may have a mutual acquaintance from the latter Sergeant Sergeant David Duty uh, Mahlouf. Um, great. great. I'm, you know, I'm hoping that uh, they'll reminisce a little bit when I talk about the fun of Nick Bay alone and uh, right. also the fun of Luna Bach, Bach San Khanim, right. um, which is a little story of how it's overfunded and very nice. So they compare it to an um, amusement park. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I want to just hold off on the question just for a second. Um, Someone wants to know, is there a Friends of the IDF chapter in LA, by the way? Yeah, there is. Okay, um, good. And then I have, and then Avraham, thank you. And Mark, thank you. And Stephanie and Leslie, thank you. I'm going to get your questions in just a second, but I want to move on. You've got a lot of fans, by the way, Max. <laughs> a lot of old and new fans. That's good, isn't it? I'm uh, thrilled to hear about it. See, that's what the book did. And that's what your service did. And really, thank you once again for your service. So you were, you were speaking in jest earlier about Jewish mothers, but before we get mm -hmm. on to um, your operations in Gaza, what happened to you and then you know, your service in the West Bank and, and some other topics, um, there was a very um, lighthearted incident, shall we say, at the very end of basic training that involved some Jewish mothers. And I was wondering if you yeah. can share that story with everyone that's on the call this evening. Of course. Um, so we were finishing uh, part of our training, which was those four days of no sleep. It's a two week uh, training mission where four days of no sleep and then uh, hiking for over a hundred kilometers. And at the end we did a little paintball, uh, worked on some explosives and uh, you know, 
when you do these missions, you pretend, okay, we're in Lebanon today and we're going to go blow up this base and then we're going to go up to this mountain. It's all fun and play, but when you're in it, you really take it to heart and you take it seriously. To then um, starting in the north, taking a helicopter, a Black Hawk down to the south and doing another week there of similar missions where we were ending the two weeks with a jump, you know, where the paratroopers were going to go to uh, do a jump out of a plane. It's great. We do our jump. And it's blazing hot, you know, it's over 100 degrees. And our commanders are like, okay, you know, now we have another 30 kilometer hike, 20 mile hike up and down the sand dunes to get to the end of training in the middle of the hot sun. And uh, I guess, uh, thank God, uh, somebody was paying attention to the weather because the doctor came up and said, no, you know, it's, it's too hot for that. People are going to get uh, hurt and dehydrated. And funny enough, right before we did the jump, somebody ended up getting... Um, uh, on this phone, ended up getting heat stroke and had to go to the hospital, which isn't uncommon when you do training. That's so difficult. Um, so the doctor said, okay, we've had enough people get hurt. We're going to wait here. A bus will come and you'll just, you know, go to the end and have the ceremony, uh, which was the secret ceremony, right? It was only the military. No one was supposed to know about it. Completely secret and completely the, the combat soldiers were there and only the combat soldiers. So we wait a few hours bus comes, we go to the, to the area for the ceremony, which is like a uh, memorial site for the Sayyid Samkhanim. And right after we finish the ceremony, in come cars and cars of uh, Jewish mothers who were the mothers of my teammates and my soldiers. And out of their trunks of the car are just truckloads of food and hummus and cake and anything that you could want. And we immediately see it and our eyes just pop out of our head out of un just unbelievable shock that one, how did they know we were here? How, how did they find us? Is there like a tracking system that all Jewish mothers have when they're looking for their kids? And two, like, oh my God, thank you for the food. We haven't eaten in a week. This is unbelievable. Um, and so we obviously helped them set up the food and just gorge for the next two, three hours uh, on it. And then, you know, sat and relaxed in the sun for the rest of the day until we went back to base, um, which is a fun, definitely lighthearted moment at the end of training and a good way I, to, to end things. Indeed, I can imagine. Uh, it was one of the lighter points actually in the book and, you know, turning then to more serious matters is, so it was the day after, right? That you were then deployed, am I correct? Um, or, or immediately after that you were then deployed to Gaza? So no, um, there was, if we go historically, you have Shavu Achim, which is when the boys were kidnapped. Mm -hmm. um, so right after training, I went and took uh, about, uh, it was supposed to take a month off to go to America and relax because lone soldiers have that opportunity. Right, yes. About two weeks into my month off, uh, the, we hear on the news of three boys being kidnapped and I'm you know, on the next flight back to Israel because my uh, team and unit get called up to go and search for them and to go into the West Bank and to try to, to find the boys of which we spent the, new the next two weeks doing. Um, and you know, unfortunately, as we know from history, um, they, they were killed and they perished. So from there, before everyone was talking about Gaza, we were on the next bus to the Gaza border um, through intelligence that there was going to be operations on the Gaza side and we needed to prepare for that. So we were um, back outside of Bastan Hanin, one of our bases by the Gaza border, and getting ready for eventually what was going to be Operation Protective Edge. And so you go into Gaza, and if, if I could just have another light moment before we get into some very serious matter, there were a group of Haredim that came in. Can you just share that just real briefly before we, because I thought that was really curious also. Yeah, um, I'll also just add to uh, the army does uh, four to eight, four month increments of um, uh, when soldiers draft. So we were like the new boys on the, on the field. You know, we had just finished two months ago from training and we're now, nobody was newer than us and we were still getting situated. And there's a little bit of uh, balagan, a little bit of chaos in the team on who was doing what and what we were going to do in the combat soldiers um, team that we were creating. And, you know, eventually a few weeks go by, we're on the bus, we have our equipment, we're getting ready to go into Gaza. 
And as, you know, literally we're putting face paint and people are letting, you know, last testaments and wills on little pieces of paper and the bus in, uh, which is kind of funny because it was like your normal egged bus. It wasn't like an armored vehicle or anything cool or interesting. It was just, you know, like you would take any, anyone would take. Um, we uh, get off the bus to go pee and go like um, take a minute to relax and come this Haredi, you know, they have these big buses where they play the loud music all the time. And you do know, the Na Na Nachman guys come out playing the loud music, having a party, and they see us in full face paint, full gear. No idea again how these people know that we're here. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to literally prepare ourselves to go into Gaza and to go to war. And they just, you know, lighten the whole mood. We all start singing and dancing and make a circle. I remember on the way in, they were like handing out Red Bulls to everybody as if they knew that like, oh, we should have an energy drink before we go into war. Sure. Um, and it was just, uh, it was almost like a fun little party right before going, going into war and going into a very difficult part of our service, my service Max, and their service. Max, that's what we call an only in Israel moment. Yes. Indeed. Actually, Actually I do want to go back to the chat here because you have some former teachers here from your days at... Um, Solomon Schechter in St. Louis, a city I know well. I went to Solomon Schechter in Chicago well before oh, okay. you, but I went to college in St. Louis, which I dearly, dearly love. Uh, but before we get to them, uh, Avraham greetings and th wants to say greetings and thanks for your service. So thank you for weighing thank in you. there, Avraham. Um, and then Mark says, just to comment, as one of Mark Spal oh. from De Toledo High School, uh, he writes, as one of Max's high school teachers, we could see this deep commitment to the state of Israel and his grit and determination. He is such an impressive young man. Wow. Congratulations on that one. Stephanie wrote in, Max, your book is amazing. Thank you for your service. What was the highlight of your IDF experience? But let's leave that for sort of more towards the end of our conversation. So thank you for weighing in there. Thank um, you, Stephanie. Yes, Leslie writes in, thank you for your service. What are your thoughts about the increasing number of Israeli high school students who are trying to get out of service as well as the former soldiers that are trying to peel back the actions of the Israeli service and what actually happens? Um, you know, I don't like to get into politics here on this program because I like to keep it just sort of uh, related to the book, if you will, if you don't sure. mind, Leslie. Um, and so... There you go. But if you want to weigh in and just say a, a word or two, I don't want to limit. Yeah, uh, I'll say a word or two. Speech. Yeah, right. I'll look. My book is is literally taken from the notes. When I was writing my book, there was a diary and I was literally taking it on my phone in the notes day to day on what I did that day. And uh, I can just talk about my own experience and what I went through. And I can't really talk too much about what other people went through. Um, and so I think the goal of the book is to show that experience through my eyes without any politics, without any trying to get you to think one way or another, just simply showing you what I went through and what it was like. And I think that, you know, the IDF is a really big place. And sometimes people are under immense stress and immense pressure. And, you know, mistakes get made. But under un unlike any other military that I've ever heard of, the, the discipline and the commitment to human life and, uh, you know, leading by example and just mitzvot and just being a good person, you literally carry a card with you. Every soldier is supposed to carry a card with you talking about that. Wherever you go, it's supposed to be in your pocket. And it's a constant reminder and a constant uh, push onto the soldiers on to be a good example and to you know, stand up for what's right, no matter what side things are happening on, just to do the best that you can and to do that at all times. Um, and so, you know, uh, unlike, you know, everybody has a bad day. And sometimes when you are the soldier with a gun and you are a young kid and you have immense responsibilities, things can slip. But the IDF as a whole is trying to push us to do the right thing and to be good people and to do the best that you can. So my experience, I think, show some of the, the grayness here and there with those areas, but also a lot of the reality and a lot of the humanity that it is to be an IDF soldier. 
And just real briefly, so you were making notes on a daily basis, and then yeah. those notes were the basis for your book. Yeah, like on my phone, you can, on my phone. Okay. Um, literally, when I would get back from a mission or when I had a few hours here and there, just write down what I did that day. Did you think you were going to write a book or you just did it for your own benefit or for your own interest? Uh, I never thought I was writing a book when I was writing notes on my phone. My initial goal was I was going through a lot of really interesting experiences and I didn't want to forget them when I got older. And I wanted to have something to either give to my kids or to give to others. And then from there, uh, when I finished my army service, I put all the notes onto my computer and realized, wow, you know, I have like three, 400 pages here. Maybe we could do something a little bit more with this. And then I started to really think in those terms of creating a book and what I could do and what this would mean. And, um, yeah, going down that route. Got it. Uh, and before we really get to Gaza, um, some more of your fans from Susan Lowe, shout out to you from your teachers at SSSDS St. Louis. Susan Lowe, Ada Parker, Kola Kavod. Thank you so much. And we echo that. Um, and then also, I'm lucky enough to know Max's parents. Max, you are one lucky guy from Sherry Moore. And then, uh, and then Leslie, thank you for addressing uh, my question. She writes in, thank you. Um, anyway, okay, so let's get on to Gaza right now. Um, you know, it's, it's a very um, important part of the book. And it's a very difficult part of the book to read. I don't know how difficult it is for you to talk about, um, but you know, like the question earlier on was, what was the highlight of your experience with the IDF? Can you just share in broad brushstrokes your experience in Gaza and what happened because you became injured throughout and you lost your brothers, several of your brothers there. And it was very, very difficult to read. Right. Um, without spoiling the whole book, yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll give the cliff notes. Um, for, so you had to talk a little bit about prepping to go into Gaza. We were my unit specializes in sabotage, explosives, anti-terror, uh, which means we work with bombs essentially. And uh, at the time, the technology that Israel had wasn't capable of destroying these terrorist tunnels that were literally going under Gaza to uh, my house, among other, some of my friends' houses because I lived on the border and kibbutz near Oz. So uh, at one point, and this is how I start the book as well, there was an incident where terrorists popped out of tunnels and were coming to attack my family and friends who lived on the border, which was immensely personal, but also, you know, you can't have a greater purpose than going to help and defend your closest family and friends. So from there, it became very real that we were going to have to go into Gaza and we were going to have to go and destroy these tunnels. And it was going to be my team and my friends that were going to be the ones looking for them and going in and actually doing the, the work to, to get rid of them. Um, and so from there, you know, uh, like all army units, you have to go in and take, um, take the field and uh, clear it out. And for us, you know, we had to go as deep as we could into Khan Yunus, which was the area of Gaza where the paratroopers were going in to find as many of the tunnels as we could. Um, after uh, a few days of finding a few tunnels and destroying them, we got uh, information that there were more tunnels further to the north of the city, and we were going to backtrack, go around and find those and destroy those as well. So for the night, we took the night to, to prepare our equipment. And there's also a lot, as you can tell, I'm skipping over here of the day-to-days and things that we saw, um, which were pretty um, unforgivable. Uh, some of the things that we saw, but also uh, eye-opening to the reality. Um, anyway, we prepare our equipment and make our way up north all night long to the new area where the tunnels were. Uh, as you know, mortars were raining down and rockets were being fired and on our side tanks were shooting back and clearing homes and clearing areas which uh, were supposed to be empty because the IDF drops leaflets to let people know, hey, this is where we're going beforehand, which is good and bad. Um, good people, innocent civilians aren't there. Bad 
it gives the enemy to, to one, get away and to prepare booby traps, uh, among other things. Uh, so as we were making our way, the first booby trap went off that ended up flipping a tank uh, in front of us. Thank God nobody was hurt and they were all okay. But it also made us very well aware of everything and how dangerous the situation was. And as we continued, it eventually became my team's turn to take the last of the homes in our way into the northern area of Kanyunis, um, where I'll remember uh, this house was about three or four stories tall, black. We were going through black bricks. We were going through uh, greenhouses at the moment. So our eyesight was um, impaired. As you can tell, those like little sheets that you have on greenhouses that you can kind of somewhat see through, but it's very blurry. Anyway, we make our way through and Paz, my, Paz Eliao, my commander, my Mothgots, uh, goes up with the fold, which is the forefront people in your team that are going to be the first ones to enter the home and open it up. And from there, everybody else makes their way into their own areas to, to clear. He puts one of our explosive devices on the house, goes, you know, three, two, one, uh, blah, uh, and it not, doesn't work. So he gets permission from our uh, commander of the unit to go a different route. Instead of going through the side of the house or the back to go through the front door, um, where as he makes his way to the front door, unfortunately, the house explodes and shrap metal goes everywhere and a huge fire erupts. Um, excuse me. And um, from there, you know, I was hit in the head with a piece of shrap metal. Um, and thankfully, I uh, wasn't um, wounded enough where I wasn't able to continue to, to operate and continue to do things. So the next step uh, was to do as much as I could to help my friends um, with their, you know, with their wounds and their injuries and helping guide the traffic, the traffic of all of the soldiers behind us who are now running forward with stretchers, running forward to help, running forward to get people who are more, uh, wounded out. And, um, you know, from there, we, we eventually make our way to the hospital. And that would be the, the ending of my chapter in Gaza, where this isn't in the book, but I do like to add a little color to the talks when I'm doing them. Uh, and the unbelievableness of those of my team that weren't wounded and the actions they took at that time to literally take their brothers, start bandaging them up. And as we were even in the hospital, um, not, to, not to necessarily mourn, but to take a moment of silence and remembrance for those that have now fallen, but then to continue on with the mission and to continue on to fight and continue on to, to operate in the way that they needed to. And that's really um, what I found was unbelievable. And, and, you know, I call them my heroes because the way that they were able to continue on and fight and the courage that they had to, to keep going, even under the most terrible of circumstances. Um, and, you know, you had to make the call to your parents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, that was obviously a little back and forth, um, as uh, any call is with my mom. Um, I would because say- need, So ultimately you needed surgery, we should add. Yeah, ultimately I needed surgery. At first I didn't even realize how badly I was wounded, maybe because of the adrenaline or because of everything going on. Um, you know, I was doing what I could to take care of those around me. Um, but yeah, eventually, uh, I remember because when I got into the tank that took us out to Gaza, my first thought was, oh, shoot, I have to call my mom now. How am I going to have that conversation? That's going to be awful. Um, even with everything going on, and we were still technically in Gaza, but we were in a tank at that point, and I was one of the last to leave. That was my next thought. Um, and so, you know, thankfully, uh, I didn't have, obviously, I didn't have my phone or anything like that. All right. personal belongings did not enter into the war. And I uh, borrowed one of the nurse's phones, asked her if I could call internationally. She said, of course. And then, you know, woke my mother up at 2 a.m. To, to tell her that I'm, I'm okay and I'm fine. But, you know, there's a little piece of metal possibly in my head. I may or may not need surgery. I'll keep you updated on how that goes. And remembering and showing her, you know, that I'm absolutely okay and there's no need to come and everyone's fine. Um, 
which at that point, I didn't know the entirety of the situation either. There was smoke and uh, I was towards the back of my team. So I didn't see, you know, everything that had happened in the front necessarily. The explosion was so intense that it wiped out half my team and also half the team behind us as well. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a lot going on and, you know, 18 other soldiers that were wounded. Um, so I didn't really know if anyone had died or not. I had speculations, but the second I had finished my call with my mother, the only thought on my head for the rest of the day was, you know, what's the situation with the team? What's the situation with everybody else? Um, and then the next thought after that was, okay, how do I get out of this hospital as fast as I can to go back in and help them out in any way that I can? Um, because I felt that I was good enough uh, to return. And that was like, it, you know, we said before, once you set your mind to something, it's going to happen. And that's what my mind was set to, was getting back to the team as quickly as possible. Yeah, you know, Max, I really want people to get the book if they haven't gotten it already to really read that whole especially that whole section on the experience you had in Gaza and then the aftermath. Um, and, you know, just in the interest of time, I want to kind of fast forward yeah. then, because we could certainly do a whole <laughs> hour just on the whole Gaza experience, truly. Um, yeah. One thing before we talk about your experience in the West Bank, though, um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, though, is your Hebrew, because even as you pointed out in the book, you even said, and I have in my notes here, that my Hebrew wasn't great. Now, sucks. <laughs> well, let me just ask you about that, because, you know, if someone has a limited uh, ability in Hebrew and they go to Israel and they ask in Hebrew and they're broken Hebrew, where's the Kotel or how do I get to the beach or whatever? That's fine. But you're in a really, really tough situation. So how did you manage that when you were there? Right. Um, a lot of live and learn. <laughs> um, sure. a, funny, a funny story, for example, would be in the tryouts where you know, we were going back and forth, sprinting, crawling, sprinting, crawling. And there was a point in time when they had yelled uh, to, to crawl and I had sprinted. And I look back behind me and see everybody on the floor flopping around trying to get to the end. Whereas I'm standing up like, like a schmuck running and immediately I turn around and, you know, start to crawl. So I would say, you know, my Hebrew was good enough to understand what was going on. But every now and then you have these little mistakes and slowly, as you spend more time with your team, as you spend more time in the army, you get used to the language. Because it's funny, um, there's Hebrew and then there's like army Hebrew, which is its own language of its own. Uh, and the language that I really had to learn and, and adopt. Uh, but, you know, it's also interesting because because you spend so much time with these guys, even my broken Hebrew, they had began to learn how to communicate with me specifically. Um, and we had a very deep uh, understanding and good communication between ourselves. Um, but, jo but jokes aside, I mean, when you were out on a mission, for example, like when you were in Gaza and you were given orders, surely you knew what those orders were. No, of course. You know, Israel has its own uh, base that they have, which is called Mikhbe Alon, which takes in uh, new immigrants and new immigrant soldiers to teach them Hebrew, which I went to. Uh, there's a funny joke again there that you end up learning more Russian or more something else than Hebrew, but uh, you know once you actually are in the IDF, everything is in Hebrew and you have to learn. And hey, I before we even get to the war, I had to learn you know explosive engineering in Hebrew. So if I was able to do that, I think they felt that I was good enough to continue with anything else. Well, I have to tell you, I, I'm a Mandarin speaker, and it, I studied uh, international relations in graduate school, and so I had to take Chinese as part of my course, and I learned how to say things like intermediate range ballistic missile and all these economic and military terms, which, of course, I never had to use when I worked in advertising in China, because it's a whole different set of lingo that you have to learn on the spot. So when I was reading about your language and how potentially you would have to use the language, it certainly resonated with me who, again, learned one set of language, but had to learn very much another set of language when, when I was finally living in China. Uh, just want to go to the chat for a second, then we're going to go to the Gaza experience. And, you know, we're, we're at the 755 mark. Do you have time to stay a little bit after school, so to speak? For yeah, yeah, I'm good. No okay, rush. great, because I just want to say, Gail Armstrong from middle school at Salman Chakter in St. Louis, uh, 
to your moving talk today. So many amazing life experiences. I look forward to having you in St. Louis at the St. Louis reunion. And then also sending love from your family in St. Louis from Nick. Oh, yeah. And um, Lorraine wants to know, uh, did your mother come to Israel once? You told her you were injured. Yeah. Wait, she well, I, I, Nick, Max, we, Max, we should say you got to buy the book. And find out <laughs> what the answer is, but but we'll just we'll cut to yeah. the chase there and say yes, she actually she actually did. Let's talk then. We're, we'll stay a little bit after school um, for the benefit. We always like to have these things within an right. hour. But again, Max, there's so much to get to with this, so we are going to stay just a couple minutes extra. So hopefully everybody uh, will stay with us here. Um, the I think just in broad brushstrokes, let's just say that. Um, the West Bank experience is very different than the Gaza experience. And what you're required to do on the West Bank was very different than the mission in Gaza. And how, how do you want to just sort of frame that in, in a moment or two? This is, I thought you would ask something like this. So I okay. picked out a page to read. because I, like I read this. my mind there, my friend. Um, yeah, okay. Let's see. So this was a quote and a small speech, the commander of my unit, Tal Jobalov, uh, spoke to us when we had finished our time in Gaza and then we're beginning to work in the West Bank, which was, look, I understand we have just finished a very intense trial in our lives. Many of you are still very much on edge from the war, but I want to make this one thing very clear to you all. Our mission here is to keep peace and order. If you get into a situation where you need to harm someone, you have then failed your mission. This was a 180 degree turn from Gaza, we just came from hunting down terrorists and blowing up tunnels and terrorist strongholds to what seemed like glorified policemen. This transition was strange, but now the, important, the importance of our actions had changed. The head of our unit made our objective very clear. We needed to help, not hurt anyone. There always seemed to be a misconception that we were defending the Jews from the Arabs living in the area, but the real fact is that we were keeping the peace. If a Jew wanted to pick a fight with an Arab and an Arab wanted with the Jew, they both had one thing in common. They would have to go through us first. So as you can hear from the passage, the goal for us in the, in the West Bank was to keep a situation under control where you wouldn't, you know, you would have uh, everybody in the area would be safe and fine and the economy could prosper and people could go about their jobs and you would have normal life like you have here in Los Angeles or New York or anywhere. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there are many instances where people have tried to make that situation not possible, um, as I talk about in, further in the book. But that was our goal. And that is, as a larger stance, the IDF's goal in, in the West Bank is to keep the peace and to keep a normalcy of life. Right. There was a quote, again, we'll stay after school just for a couple of minutes. I beg everybody's indulgence, but there was a wonderful quote that you had here in the book. Um, I wrote it down at page 127. Uh, and I think it also applies to what's going on when we turn on the news and see what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, it is, um, oh, excuse me, 217. I mentioned in our last book group that I desperately need new readers. And I never, and I didn't get them from the last book group, Max. So that's going to be our my next assignment is to get new readers, because I read the wrong okay. note here. Okay, for our next uh, book group, which is in November. Anyway, here we go. Ah, here we are. It's page two seventeen, uh, and again, apropos of what's going on even in the news today, we don't learn much when everything goes right. We learn the most when things go wrong. Okay, so I guess I wanted to ask you to comment on that just real briefly and then one or two other points and then we'll head off into the sunset. Um, right, you know, I'll, I'll take it all into like a micro approach and look at, you know, sure. my specific team and what we did uh, and how that quote came about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as any combat soldier will tell you, intelligence is the most important thing and often it goes awry. And when it goes awry, you know, it's a balagan, who knows what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an operation that there was somebody, um, a terrorist who had planted uh, bombs and was in charge of making bombs and had, you know, over a hundred kills. It killed over a hundred people. And we got the information, we understood where he was living and we're like, okay, you know, we're going to wait till 2 a.m. at night. We're going to knock on his door and we're going to pick him up. 
you know, we're not going to kill anybody. We're going to do this quietly and silently and in the middle of the night. And we're going to, you know, take him to go to trial, to, to be arrested and go from there. Because again, we're not judge, jury, and executioner. We're just like policemen. Um, so come in, we're, we're going down uh, the hill to where his house is in the middle of the night. And of course, uh, a dog starts barking at us. And uh, the owner of the house wakes up, comes out with a flashlight, and we say, oh, stop. You know, we, he immediately freezes when he sees, you know, 20 IDF soldiers with black masks on and guns pointed at him. And he's like, okay. So we, we take him like, okay, well, we don't know what to do with you. So we're just going to have you walk around with us and, you know, um, make sure you're quiet. And we go on from there to where we get to a crossroads. And at this night, there were supposed to be three operations. My team was getting one person and we had two other teams um, from other special forces units getting other people. So we go into our house and the commander of um, another team told us, hey, it's, it's actually this house that you guys are supposed to go to, the one next door, as we could read on the, on the maps. So we surround the house and, you know, I'm kind of cutting to the cliff notes of the story here, but, um, we, we, bang, we, we surround the house and then we get intelligence like, oh no, it was, you guys were actually right. It was the first house. So we go to that house. Again, we knock on the door, we go through the door and we're standing there by this um, Arab man in his pajamas. And he's talking to uh, one of the guys of the Shin Bet who we work with is like Israel's FBI. And they're talking in Arabic. And we end up coming to the understanding that the guy doesn't even live there anymore. The whole thing was for naught. And we had wasted an entire night. And to make it even better, the head of the Special Forces Paratroopers was with us that night and watching our actions and seeing how we were operating and basically grading us, which was even better because you obviously want somebody there when everything kind of goes kaput. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, we got the joke, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I guess, you know, from that instance, we took what we could and learned from what we could, which was one, you know, first off, be confident in what you made your decision to be the first time. If another commander who isn't a part of your team tells you, hey, it's this other house, what does he know? You know, he wasn't the one going through the maps and the missions and practicing and doing everything and making everything right. So even if, you know, um, a former uh, boss or commander is telling you one thing, you know, make sure to stand up for yourself and to, to, to argue with that because you're the one who's on the ground and knows what's going on and who's gone through everything. And, you know, many other lessons that we took from that as well that we improved on. So Max, as we really wind down our conversation, you've been so generous with your time and we, we truly thank everybody for joining us. Just a couple really, really quick points. Uh, what's been the response from the book? Um, well, thankfully the response has been uh, very positive which I'd say when I was first thinking of publishing the book, I was very nervous about mm -hmm. because it's a very personal book and yeah. uh, definitely puts myself out there in a lot of ways. So I'm incredibly thankful that the response has been so positive and so um, overwhelmingly warm and um, you know kind-hearted and nice. And I will want to point out that the best response I got was from three boys who are currently in the IDF who had told me that it helped them actually pass some of their own tryouts in the idea, which, you know, I was unbelievable. I can't believe that something I wrote had helped them accomplish what I believe to be one of their dreams and one of their goals. So I think that was definitely one of the proudest moments I've had since writing the book about it. Yeah, because I would imagine it would be immensely helpful for anybody that was even contemplating uh, joining the IDF. H how much time are you spending in Israel now? I definitely go back uh, at least once or twice a year. I'm still in the reserves. So I go back and um, go to the reserves at least once or twice a year, which at this point is just kind of a glorified reunion with all of my friends from my team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we'll go to the shooting range or maybe do a week as we had before where we'll have no sleep and go up and down mountains and go back to it. Um, yeah, but, you know, I'm definitely in Israel as much as I can. And, and I, I, I want to close with a question, and then I have a big kind of uh, 
a suggestion for everybody. So everybody stay on, but I want you to answer the question from Vicky, Vicky Simons, which I was gonna ask you about towards the end anyway, how did you come up with the name Under the Stretcher? I think I have an idea, but if you just wanna share it in your own words. Yeah. Um, I would say the book is about perseverance and never giving up. And there's a drill that we do in the army, which is when you take your buddy and you pretend, sometimes not pretend, that he's wounded and you put him on the stretcher and you, you know, bring him to safety, which usually is up a large mountain for a few hours. And we do this every week in training. And we always do this after we're exhausted from hiking and training all week. You know, you haven't slept, you haven't eaten much. But the second they say, you know, emergency, your friends just blew up and we need to put them on a stretcher and get them up the mountain. Everything stops. You don't care about how hungry you are. You don't care about how tired you are. You're in the movie of that really just happened. You take your friend on the stretcher and you go accomplish and you go up to wherever it is, no matter how far you forget about whatever anguish, exhaustion that you've had. And you kind of flip that switch. And that then creates this immense brotherhood between um, your teammates and you that one, you're able to accomplish such a difficult task, but two, you're the guy, I, you, you become that guy who says, no matter what, I have your back. No matter how exhausted or tired I am, I'll be the one to gather, get you to safety and carry you over under any of the circumstance. And, and that's now, why it's called that. And that's why you called it under stretch. And now really final question before just one point that I just want to make, and then we're off in the sunset. Going back to Stephanie's question, do you have one experience just real briefly in like 15 seconds that you can um, share from the that's idea? That's a highlight? Yeah. I have, okay, a fun one was, I don't know if it's the highlight of, uh, the most highlight, but it's definitely a good one, is uh, in basic, actually at the end of basic training, I was uh, coming to the parachuter jump course and I see out of the corner of my eye, this other little skinny Jewish boy who looks familiar. And then I get a little closer and it's my, one of my best friends, Amitai Schumann, who I've known since I was like eight or nine years old. And he's there too, in his own special forces unit, doing his own uh, paratrooping course and jump course. And I was in complete shock and just to see him and be reunited and to even have that moment of like doing the army together for a, for, for a few weeks was, was really incredible and really a highlight for, for a while. Max, we cannot thank you enough, not only for your service, but for joining us here on this August reading series from Jewish National Fund. Once again, this is the book okay. Under the Stretcher. We can't recommend it enough. We wanna thank you so much truly for joining us. And let me just say that um, for everybody that has joined us for the last, we've been doing these, Max, actually for over a year now, since I can't even remember when. Um, but we've been doing these uh, uh, reading series. We're taking a break in September, October, because we have all the Chagim in September. And October is the planned Jewish National Fund mission to Israel. So we're going to come back in November with an amazing book. We're going to have all sorts of great information about that. And I just want to give everybody a little piece of sort of uh, advice or a suggestion, if you will, because... You know, and I got this actually, Max, after reading your book, because again, I plowed through it really quickly and it gave me such great insight that I kind of thought to myself, you know, we have Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur coming up. We have Sukkot coming up. Everybody gets invited to a sukkah party or a breakfast or a Rosh Hashanah dinner. Hanukkah is coming up, I think the end of November this year, right? So it's all early. So if you're thinking of a gift to give to somebody when you go to their house, Please plant a tree. It's only 18 bucks. It's less than a really nice bottle of wine. So you can certainly plant a tree with Jewish National Fund. Go to jnf.org, plant your tree for 18 bucks and buy a book for your host and hostess so they can learn a little bit more about Israel, whether it's Max's book, Under the Stretcher, or, whoops, I pulled out a whole bunch of other books that we've had here. <laughs> on a reading series, whether it's Lioness by Francine Klagsbrunn, David Nassau's The Last Million, Noah Tishby's Israel, Zionism, The Concise History by Alex Rivchin, whatever it is, we really wanna get people reading. We wanna get them to be planting trees. Once again, jnf.org, give a tree to everybody, but we also really- fire too. 
Just to add, the fires in Israel now is like especially plant a tree. Absolutely. My friends in Israel are going to plant trees. It's that important now. Yeah, because again, because of the fires and also it's a mitzvah, but it's better than bringing a bottle of wine. It's more long lasting than any other kind of host or hostess gift and buy them a book so people can get educated and further educated and get further insight into Israel. And um, that's all that I had. How's that for a suggestion, Max? I love it. Thank you so much, David. Anyway, listen, it was great to see you. Always great to meet a fellow Midwesterner and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. We want to wish everybody a great evening, a Shana Tova, and really thanks so much for joining us here. And we look forward to seeing everybody in November, November 17th for our next reading series. Max, thanks for writing the book and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Shana Tova. Shana Tova.